Okay, well, let's get started anyway. So let me share my screen here. Um, so welcome. We've got, what is today? February 19th. Uh, moving right along here. So today I want to actually introduce uh, a design sprint. I'd like to hold a sprint for the open source golf cart. Now that comes out of the blue somewhat. Well, not totally. Let me shake this a little bit. Um, but it turns out uh, power cubes, hydraulics, uh, they actually make it very easy to do a golf cart. And actually Katrina here asked me to do so for getting around the farm. And it could potentially be a good, a good, easy success. Now, when we started talking about it, so I have a document. If you look at the, um, so today's dev team meeting, see that in the chat. Let um, me paste that in. Okay, there's the the document. No, is it? Well, it's in a click on the OS golf cart link and right in the working document. And it'll take you to that. Now, uh, one of the things I've been talking about also is some um, working on the book, uh, getting the 3D printer work business off the ground in terms of background funding. So kind of transitioning to the model of, of the workshops or 3D printers as a stable revenue model, trying to scale that. That's still in progress. Uh, we had a nice um, build last week at Highland Community College, planning some more for the future. Um, but one thing that came out, so if we talk about FIRST Robotics or OSE clubs, um, I do believe that a golf cart could be a, an interesting project. So I talked to Katarina about this. Um, so. On one hand, we're doing the open source cordless drill challenge. That's on one side, but let's think about what a golf cart would do. I mean, that's a thing that people can drive in, and driving is fascinating, kind of a, a vehicle of some sort. And if we make it an open source solar golf cart, that could be a compelling package that includes, you got solar energy, you got uh, calculations of energy and power, you've got mobility motors. Um, we can make it hydraulic so that the the drive is hydraulic going to hydraulic motors, which are which is one low-cost way to do it. So, uh, an interesting concept. But let's go to the um, to the golf cart uh, presentation, and I want to go through that. And I do want to actually call for a design sprint this Saturday, uh, sometime, uh, or rather Friday or Saturday. Friday would work like uh, let's say you know 1 p.m. or so. So we might want to try for day like Friday. Um, what I will do is uh, make an announcement. We do have a, a design sprints list of people who people have signed up. But if you want to start looking at this document here, uh, do take a look at that. So with the, the existing infrastructure of power cubes, uh, hydraulic motors, it actually makes it a low-hanging fruit kind of project because we're, you're not trying to optimize for some performance like torque or speed or anything. It's kind of like low low speed up to 20 miles per hour which is a legal golf cart that uh, you don't have to have a license for um, thinking about a 5 by 8 body um, thinking about I mean, let me share my screen actually uh, so share the yep so take a look at that on the screen if you want um, power cube so like Abe's been working on a power cube for a long time uh, same power cube, 16 horsepower. Um, body, a body of the golf cart about five by eight feet. Uh, easiest way to do it. If, so, so look at what golf carts are. They, that's what they look like. They're for moving around. You could look in different different forms. Um, for us, if you look from the side, you've got option one, option two. Option two. Uh, imagine uh, using something like box beam tubing like on a tractor well but that gets kind of heavy you don't need that for a golf cart so what if we use angle but once again use a frame that's similar to the construction of of the 3d printer the OSCD 3d 3d printer so basically an, a, a much larger frame i would say quarter by four by four angle but what that means is that you're making big panels flat panels 
that are the six sides and then welding that into a cubic frame because that's the easiest way to work with angle to make a perfectly aligned frame uh, as we've been finding out so easy way to do a frame some wheels power cube uh, power cube is 16 horsepower uh, dimensions we're looking at different dimensions we're gonna pick off dimensions from industry standard so five foot seven inch height um, and so forth so if you look at look at standard ways people do this that's what you get um, up to like about 10 feet in length for the long versions of these things uh, just more industry standards uh, dimensions what does this thing look like tire so you can uh, look at grab cad and other online sources for files and of tires in step format add to that some hydraulic motors and the power cube and there you go if you look at the hydraulic motors 149.99 at surplus center for 5.4 cubic inches this the second one here would be something that would be interesting to us it gives us just about the right speed from between like uh, 14 to 28 miles per hour for this one um, that one there a uh, four-wheel drive how about an all-terrain golf cart uh, four of those cost six hundred dollars that's doable once again the same kind of engine like we've been doing a little bit of calculations that say this will go at 27 miles per hour and so forth so that's where we're at right now but we'd like to see if we can keep evolving this to a, a full CAD drawing so starting with a CAD like here we've got some of the part libraries wheels a bench like what do you do for the seat uh, do a simple bench um, and so forth so that's that's um, that's what I have done um, for a little bit this weekend uh, but in the meantime also working on a 3d printer and book and stuff so so that's my report but I will announce this um, what's what's the timing look like for people so how about like can we do like 1 p.m. on Friday and then invite the greater community and see who shows up just with a few days a few days of notice um, does Friday work for anybody here yeah what what time uh, let's say 1 p.m. on Friday so we go for a couple of hours and see how far we get in that kind of time but let's see if we can start uh, assembling that in FreeCAD so basically work work up a, a part library of, of wheels hydraulic motors the drawing out the frame in detail um, it's a basic structure actually so let's see let's see where we get on that okay so I guess you have some documents you you're showing already yeah that you've drawn up yeah. that gives some preparation point because yeah sometimes that that I guess is issue people don't know what's um, going on so I guess we're just gonna start drawing parts right everybody yeah. pick a part and draw some stuff right yeah yeah start coming up with a part library um, whatever we can find online for ad admissible parts like tires and hydraulic motors we can borrow hydraulic motor uh, you know we can borrow those stuff from the other like micro track and other places but they're not exactly the right thing but we can so we can start drawing up the more exact version of what's online if we can't find something similar so based on who who shows up divide the uh, create part libraries uh, for the golf cart uh, so I'll paste in a couple of uh, I'll paste in the first slide here. Yeah. Okay. Um, now this this is something that you know with a few hours of good design we can actually build this out pretty much readily. As far as on the on the power cube, what we can do is we talked about like anytime we build something we might want to evolve the the design and the, we mentioned about splitting the power cube into hydraulic tank unit basically hydraulics unit and then an engine unit so the engines could be easily swapped out for for fixing or repair 
Um, cause definitely like the engine is going to be the thing that fails quickly. Um, on the micro track, just to report there that I couldn't fix, uh, the pull cord. It's a pull cord start, pull start, but it also has battery start. Now the pull cord just totally, I don't know, flaked out, doesn't roll back in. Try to open it up. It looks like the spring is broken or such. Uh, so now we can run it on, say, the battery, but I'd have to get replacement parts for the pull cord. But with that kind of stuff in mind, uh, it'll be nice to have, have that engine module completely easily uh, take out a bull. Uh, so I think maybe in this time around we might want to see if we can split the power cube into two units, one being the, um, the hydraulic with multiple openings like we've done before, and then the second one just for the engine itself, which is like we did for the the one of the recent power cube versions except that we would eliminate the cooler from that part because the cooler might be just on the hydraulic reservoir now one one additional thought about the cooler uh, now we use a dedicated cooler what if we weld it on fence to our hydraulic power unit module that's another way to go that might be a decent route as well if we don't want a dedicated um, a dedicated hydraulic cooler. Now, of course, the hydraulic cooler is going to be more efficient, like, you know, for the space, or, I don't know, it's, it's just probably going to do more heat rejection, but for a simple system, I think, just welding on, like, say, either quarter by two or eighth inch by two fans to the whole surface of the reservoir, that wouldn't be a bad idea either, so we might want to try that. Uh, I guess we would have to look at some basic calculations of surface area and heat exchange with that because we know that a dedicated heat exchanger has a lot of surface area with the all the broken out fins but maybe we can get an idea of what the per some calculations would be for just a basic fin exchanger like, just like on the extruder for d 3D the printer the tight and narrow extruder it's got the uh, aluminum fins on the extruder part um, this would be welding steel fins to the hydraulic reservoir part, so that might be another option. Uh, I know that some places around the world you might have a hard time getting hydraulic coolers, like for example, a recent conversation with the Belize crew, they said that they make their own coolers because they're very expensive down in Belize, so the guy who uh, stewarding our brick press down there. Um, so yeah, we, we can try that. But this would be good to move the power cube a little bit forward and see like the basic first implementation of vehicles for the overall Global Village construction set, going up to 20 miles per hour for road legal, no license required. Uh, you've got to be like 16 years old to drive this. That's um, all. Okay, so that's, um, that's on my side here. Um, also had... Just a couple, I uh, just started drawing up, uh, I do want to go to one more thing, I'm uh, um, thinking about 3D printing of useful products, I've been doing some thinking about that and printing and, and rubber filaments because that's absolutely relevant for things like what if you want to print rubber tires for this puppy, this this little golf cart, well completely doable, uh, but you got to be effective at, at printing rubber, so I put up a document called the OSC 3D printer extruder. Oh, I gotta go to my drive. I didn't put the link in there. Um, but considerations for rubber printing. I uh, actually noticed on a wiki that's that Eric, another Eric, not this Eric here, another Eric posted a... Let's see what we got here. Posted a, an article on... Uh, on a flexible filament extruder. Let me see here. Flexion extruder it's called. I was like, wow. That's probably possibly better than the Titan Arrow, which is optimized for flexibles too. But it boils down to actually like I I need to just test the the speed of printing with flexible filaments here using the existing Titan Arrow. Um, so if you take a take a look at the working document there, what I have on the screen, um, this is the insides 
of what a Titan arrow looks like. So the thing I want to point to is this distance there. So the drive drive gear is there. So you're driving a filament down a throat so that you can push that filament so the arrow is pointing to the drive gear the filament goes like this like that that's where the filament goes through. It's driven like that. But you see this neck area bef like after the drive gear. Um, so that's right, drive. So we got a drive gear, but there's a there's a long neck, there's this distance here, like all the way up to there before you enter the metal parts for the actual ex the hot elements that melt the thing. So all that space between the drive and, uh, and, and the metal parts, oh, that's like that space. Not optimal for flexible filaments. That's a space where you can have where you're pushing a filament that can curl up on you, right? So if it's a very flexible filament, um, you can get into the details of what the hardness of rubber-like filaments is. But uh, if it's as soft as a rubber band, you might you might kind of think, well, yeah, that you can push a rubber band down from the back into an aperture. Um, so there'll be limits. So we want to shorten up that distance as much as possible. You can see the link for the flexion extruder there, up in. Uh, so that's a contribution from Eric, not not Polliner, but another Eric on the wiki. Uh, the flexion is got, closes up that gap, and I'm thinking it's like wow, mm, interesting. Let's we might want to design another extruder that's that's closing up that gap. I was thinking about using these gear down steppers because the thing is about this the tight and narrow. This big wheel is a geared down wheel from the stepper motor uh, stepper motor shaft is, let me label that right there, the stepper motor shaft is there. Stepper shaft. That's where the shaft is. Uh, and it's driving this bigger gear for like a three or four, I don't know how much, five fold gear down or so. Um, you need a gear down. So uh, if you want to simplify the extruder proper, use, the ge use a gear down stepper motor. You can do that. Maybe we can use regular motors and planetary gear, 3D printed planetary gears as the gear down. Because you can print planetary gear downs pretty well using 3D printing. Uh, but anyway, just started thinking about what the optimal extruder would look like that can handle, first of all, 3 millimeter filaments because the flexion filament uh, extruder, the flexion 3D printer extruder, that's 1.75 millimeters. So once again, we're uh, off the shelf. The best ever you can get for flexible filaments is the Titan Arrow. And this is what we're using because we want high industrial performance for all kinds of filaments. Um, but it's... I just noticed this today, like, I don't like this part here. The distance between the drive and the metal and the flexion avoids that. So we might have to design our own, like, where the drive is, like, right next to the metal. Uh, we'll see. But uh, given that the the Titan Arrow is 100 bucks, I don't know. We might have to start building our own. We'll see. Uh, definitely something for the longer term because uh, we want to optimize for for fi filaments that are flexible, like for printing wheels off of our golf cart. So that's just some considerations there. Uh, and thinking about wh whereas the standard filament goes up to three millimeters, like what about even th thicker filament? So it's easier to push that through, or you can print larger objects. It's easier to 
you talk about thicker filaments, it's easier to on the production side because if we talk about making our own filament using a filament maker, like the Lyman filament maker, uh, it's easier to produce less of a fatter filament than more of a thinner one, um, based on like tolerances. Because the fatter it is, the less accurate you have to be. Uh, so that's just the general idea. We we might want to go into we definitely want to do three millimeter, which is what we do now. Definitely not 1.75, which for flexibles, I mean, sorry, uh, that's not going to make it uh, for flexibles in general. I mean, you have to print really slow, so we want to go to three millimeter and possibly develop five millimeter as we go along. So that's a brief note on um, on the f filament extruders um, for 3D printers with a tight narrow that we are currently using. Okay. Uh, I think I'll stop there on my side, and let's. I'd like to hear more updates from other people. So maybe we can have Nathan. Maybe you can go. Um, can you report on what you've been up to? I'm not seeing anyone else. That everyone's been having problems connect. Really. It, my my Jitsi user interface is really flaky, and people keep popping in and out, and so on. So mm. I, I don't know. Maybe we need to do a restart, but I think we might have lost uh, everyone else. I'm not sure. Oh. It looked like people were still trying to reconnect, and Jin was having audio issues. Oh wow. Well. Um, let's try what happens when we do a restart. But let's see. At that point, let me make sure I save this or stop the recording no actually no I'm not doing Jitsi okay no this can go okay so let's I'm just gonna hit refresh Yeah, well, I don't know, Abe. It looks like it might just be you and I here. Um, Abe, do you want to continue with your update? Okay. I uh, got that clamp for um, done, and I guess you looked at it. I don't know. Did you get a chance to uh, test print that at all? No, I did not. Um, okay. But let's talk about that a little bit. So, yeah. So that's that's the final version. We we do want to print. Yeah, I can go right after this. Uh, I can just put it on. Uh, and you've got the you emailed me the the STL file, right? So that's that's the one I want to use. Yeah. Yeah. I'll 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 just print it out right after the meeting. Um, it. I mean, you can see it has. Um, uh, it had to be real close and thin in places to mm -hmm. to get to that thirty millimeter bolting possibility uh, uh -huh. and I tried to fix some of the other the other shapes to try to make it print better hopefully but mm. um, yeah hopefully that's strong enough for prints well I don't know what settings will be good for that but I suppose it, it actually doesn't hopefully contain too much plastic there in some ways it's, it's pretty tight between mm. all the holes and everything so it it shouldn't use a lot of uh, plastic but the Thin points, uh, they should be okay. I mean, the bolts will make it stronger, and uh, it's just a, a short bolt and a long bolt for the actual attachment. Uh, as far as the rest of the assembly, i got to keep going on that and check some of the other parts. But um, mm -hmm. I was kind of reviewing that and seeing how long that, and just the process of that, because it, it takes a little while, took a little while to develop the clamp mainly and some of the other stuff that I was trying to get better with the uh, assembly being faster but uh, so I've been looking more at, at some of the Python and FreeCAD scripts and, and digging into that it, it can be a little more complicated but I found some good examples of, uh, of scripts and macros that help me understand some of that better and mostly it's just a matter of reading you know a lot of the, the Python uh, in in freak had the methods and all that stuff that's in the uh, uh, the kind of already referenced in the Python for freak had uh, programming I think it's 
we've got programming 101 and that kind of stuff. There's lots of good links there. And I've, I've found a few other links. Maybe I should add those to that page somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, there are different macros and examples of how to... Um, you have to generalize the macros. A lot of times the macros don't they'll work and they'll repeat something, but because the code is, is specific to uh, whatever you you know, you're doing at the time, like it'll generalize to just the generic sketch names or uh, the uh, internal variables are, are uh, always some generic thing that it names in the code. And so to write a macro that's repeatable, you kind of have to go back and figure out how to uh, uh, write code in there to adjust the, the macro so that it's more universal and it's compatible with uh, anything that you might want to do, make it repeatable, but um, mostly I also looked a lot of stuff to figure out assembly options for FreeCAD, but I, I think I've checked with it before, I still don't find anything better than um, assembly, this stuff might be better than assembly too, but it has the same issues I think mostly, so um, kind of keep things with the standards we have I guess on that. Uh, maybe until, until something gets finalized, and I don't know if that's going to happen when they finalize FreeCAD. Maybe not 0.17, maybe 0.18, who knows. Mm -hmm. So, it's hard to speculate on that, but the assembly does seem to take more time than some things. I mean, it's easy to draw parts, you know, for anybody to do that, but sometimes the collaborative issues in the assembly, uh, that can be a little bit more difficult, but the ways we have set to do that, I think, work. Uh, if it just may take a little more time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, let's see. Yeah, I guess we could. Uh, Jesse, you have some working ducks on that golf cart. It, is that? We could talk about that more. Mm -hmm. The. Uh, let's see, you said it's going to have uh, solar, I guess, on top. That's maybe for well, some batteries and so on. We're considering putting a PV panel because um, the the 16 horsepower Duramax has like one or two amps of charge, so it wouldn't be able to run a cooling fan. That's that's an issue. Yeah. And then we could have like a fan yeah. for electrical, like lights and other stuff. Um, so a solar panel yeah. on top would be a decent idea. Yeah. Because it's not to be um, really an ATV so much or more complicated. It's just keep it a simple golf cart. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Keep it a simple golf cart for now. Um, User-friendly so so Katerina can start it. We are talking about uh, adding electric start to that. Um, definitely oh. electric start. She'd like to have that. Um, yeah. That make it easier. And I recall that electric start was a little more, but then that also puts out, uh, let's see, that version has more like a, I don't know if it has an alternator, but it has something where it puts out more power uh, than the one without electric start, right? I'm not sure. There's there's two types. One is 16 horsepower. The other one is 18 horsepower. Um, both have this oh. electric start option, but I think both of them have the crappy charging all of them have this, oh. it's like a 2 amp charger, so that wouldn't be enough to run a fan. It could basically yeah. charge a battery uh, passively, I guess, just for starting, uh, but you nothing need at more. at least a, a small sized uh, solar panel, and of course a larger one depending on the size of the vehicle. Right. Uh, you could the use cover it as a roof. Give, provide the, the roof, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, Yep. Let's see. Just on, um, just to back up to the clamp work, uh, is that D3D Mini PVC? Is that where you're putting the documents for the clamp and all that? The clamp yes, the part D3D library? Mini PVC, uh, yeah, the part library there, and let's see, there was a working document associated with that originally. Uh, Mount clamp. I think that's linked there on that page somewhere. So, yeah, see, at the frame. 12 yeah. February is the last. Yeah. Okay, so I'm just keeping track, making sure I can find all the files. I, I think that from what I've looked like on the assembly in general, it looks like the other parts and things will clear, but uh, 
sometimes there's been different arrangements. I know on the axes or or um, the way that the extruders in different parts have mounted, but um, I think everything clears on this just by looking at it. But I'm going to add, of course, uh, I think a bunch more things to the uh, assembly. Some of the smaller parts, the uh, end stops, and and of course the extruder and stuff like that, just to see how stuff arranges better. Mm -hmm. um, I know there's different, slightly different ways, I think, to do that. Uh, right. Depending on, um, yeah, how, how it uses the, the volume, I guess, best, or um, where some things might clear the frame. The frame having that diameter, uh, three-quarter diameter like that, could cause issues at certain points. But um, yeah, I think the only issue is just any, any issues with the end stops would be... Uh, a bit of a problem, but there, there may be different ways to mount those too. So, yeah, it gets us really close to a you know a construction set like that. If you think about students at schools could use, that would be I think that would be pretty good. Um, yeah. Yeah, there's a bunch of other little stuff, I guess, in the part library to catch up on, too. I haven't uh, detailed some of those um, too much. Some of those are the, the parts already exist. I guess they need to be added. Um, and I think I think the length on the on the axis is fine. So to just add add the axis, it's the same. Um, I guess there's some parts that are not listed on that part library, too, like, uh, well, the bed hold. Well, oh, no, the pen. The, the print bolt, bed holder is listed there. Okay, so some of that stuff just needs to be added and cleaned up a little. Um, yeah, there's just more stuff to check on the assembly of that. And hmm. mm -hmm. I think it's pretty similar to uh, the other printers. And I, I found some information so from the, the manual on the, uh, the printer. Uh, that's pretty useful. Mm -hmm. Better idea of the assembly order, which uh, will be a little different for uh, this probably in some ways, but I was trying to figure out what ways it might be different. There's going to be a little just probably assembly order complications because of the, the clamp and the way it goes together. Stuff might have to be bolted together in a different order. It's a little bit different, but yeah. Hmm. And I don't know how. Uh, let's see if I don't know how PVC would compare to having to do anything differently with um, assembly versus the uh, if it's printed PLA. If those parts get printed. Um, it's so just using PVC. I'm not sure how that might affect um, the assembly. I guess the tolerances could vary. You got to be careful about just making sure that all the sides are the that? same length, so that you've got parallel y-axes and everything is straight. So there's yeah. some consideration there. Mm -hmm. But if, for example, we we 3D print the actual tubing members, then they can be pretty pretty exact, right? So that would be pretty good because you're guaranteed yeah, I recall a fraction of a millimeter difference so much shrinkage and things on parts but as long as it's consistent um yeah not familiar with the printing stuff that way yet but it it should be close enough and sometimes you have to scrape the parts a little or something if they're not perfect but yeah uh the pvc isn't going to be exact either i think that the Assembly mostly, yeah, it's going to be about keeping the the frame square and things like that, which requires some uh, thought to probably marking things and carefully putting it together uh, to keep the the lengths exactly the same. Yeah, where yeah. the square the frame matters, uh, which seems to be a, some of that I noticed in the process for the other the mid printer in the manual I noticed a lot of stuff about keeping things even and, and the rod lengths and all that um, so that most of that should be the same it's just um, 
yeah, a little more different squaring practices for the tubing frame. Yeah. Um, and the idea that the PVC frame is lighter, so if we need stiffness on it, you can drill a hole in the top of the frame and fill it with concrete or like plaster of Paris or something to fill in the inside so it's a stiff, heavy frame. Because PVC is going to be light by itself. So that's just another yeah. consideration. Yeah, the plastic um, be lighter. Yeah, I'm curious about the filling, if that's necessary. I think, well, I think John, if we haven't heard much while on, on uh, John was doing the PVC printer. And uh, I've seen other examples, people use PVC for printers. So it can't be um, uh, too lacking in stiffness. I, I suppose that mainly affects speed, which for a small printer, for a lot of people, is not really an issue. Right. Uh, I assume that, that the speed, if you try to pick that up, then there might be more vibration. I, I, but right. for accuracy, I assume you just have to slow things down, and that's that makes yeah. it uh, go okay. But, yeah, most people are probably not too worried about speed. But, um, yeah, having a metal frame, if it's more accurate and a little faster, might be uh, always an advantage. But... Yeah, yep, yep. Yeah, I'm looking at, you know, on slide number seven, um, as far as the clamps going onto the frame, they also serve to reinforce the frame a little bit, so that's good. For a small printer, it might be just the perfect case. You, you know, you have a four, six by six inch print area and, and you don't really mind going too slow, or you can just as we said, just completely reinforce it. You can put um, a plate across one of the square sides, which will completely stiffen up a side. So there's different ways to go about that, and it'll be interesting to... I mean, it's really like you can fine-tune and optimize that kind of a design. I, I would say to be pretty high performance, uh, as long as you have a high-quality extruder, you know, depending on what you're looking for. But yeah, yeah, it's definitely... Uh, worth to play with and engineer around now yeah i hadn't thought about bracing that much but i suppose yeah. people could try uh different bracing options on it uh you could probably just 3d print some braces and and bolt them on however if you wanted to yeah uh, i mean a brace that. meaning like the way you can s completely solidify a four-sided uh frame is by putting something a plate on that that means you're preventing yeah. paralleling completely, so it completely stiffens that that side. Yeah, now I'm yeah looking I can at... see the wooden fuse there. Um, all, all of the stuff is, is kind of uh, parallel or perpendicular, so having a diagonal brace, that, that might solve some of the vibrational issues if that became an issue at a higher speed. So sometimes a diagonal uh, right. across something really helps on yeah. a cube like that. I'm looking at... Um, John's printer here. Is he having any luck there? Um, initial pr printing is starting. Moved it to the indoors. Um, and I also asked John about high high temperature pumps. So one of the things I looked at is linear solar concentrator is that if you look at my log linear solar concentrator um, we're looking at can you actually get saturated water which means water above 100 degrees Celsius through a simple solar concentrator uh, system and we were looking at okay what about pumps how do the pumps look Let's see, I'm trying to click on this link. This taco pump. Okay, yeah, yeah, so that's, yeah, that's a heavy duty kind of a looking thing. Um, but I wanna point out, going back to that and then we'll, um, yeah, let me go back to my log regarding solar concentrator. Because there's a, I did some calculations on that. DIY solar concentrators since that was yesterday. So um, 
OC France did a did a model back in I think it was like 2016 or 17. Um, and there's a parabolic tubular collector from this Canada guy in this parabolic tube section right here. Um, he was using evacuated glass tubes, but looking into evacuated glass tubes, they're typically one end open, and we can probably find two ends open, but we need to find them, but not to use Nixism. So I was looking at, okay, what happens when you do uh, solar concentration upon a black tube, just one inch p black pipe? At one, at one sun, it goes up to 90 degrees Celsius based on Boltzmann, Boltzmann's law of the sigma t to the fourth, the, the radiation from a black body. You end up with 90 degrees. But if you have three sun concentration, the max goes up to above 200 Celsius, which is good. So given that system like shown in the parabolic tube part here, uh, this is under DIY solar concentrator. Uh, if you look at that, that's like probably like 18 fold concentration. So yeah, we've got plenty of temperature. So as long as we can pump that water, we can get saturated water, which means water above 100 degrees Celsius, which means it builds up pressure and, and, and contained in a thing like a propane tank at 18 atmospheres. That can be nighttime power storage. So that's, that's a mouthful there. But um, we have to understand saturated water, which means water above 100 degrees C. It's a competitor to batteries, so so that's why I was looking at it, and the numbers actually look good. For that a simple basic parabolic tube concentrator, parabolic with black pipe, so parabolic shapes behind, like something like reflective mylar or aluminum, uh, aluminized mylar or something like that. Uh, par parabolas with a bunch of one-inch pipe could easily get you over 200 Celsius with 18 fold concentrations. That's pretty good news and I uh, just wanted to point that out that that's something to potentially um, well I mean we're doing that in a global village construction set so it's just providing the background theory but the numbers at least look good and it's worth replicating with a guy in the parabolic tube link. Let me just click on that. Um, this system here uh, this is what he's doing this kind of very simple system parabolic troughs of, I think he's using, I think that surface there is aluminized mylar or something to that effect. It might be plain aluminum, but that's that's how that system looks and it can can get you pretty decent temperatures. Um, so that's that's something to look at. Okay, but that's that's a side, side report and some of the research I've been doing in the background. Um, in the meantime here with John John's printer that will be good to see if he gets any decent results. I guess he would have to do some stiffening. I, I'd, I'd like to see what kind of quality he's getting uh, with his setup. But right now I can see, I mean, it doesn't look particularly stable right now as it is. But he might, if he goes slow, he'll get decent prints. Um, so he's doing some decent work there. Um, okay, so the clamp we're going to print. Let's just take a look at Nathan's part library. So, so what I asked Nathan to do is put these things into a part library, and that is good, because now we see these basic elements that have the magnet holes to be where, where you do a sandwich. The background story to this is, after looking at the link I sent to Nathan, what if the magnets, you have a double sandwich and put the magnets inside so that the, you don't even have to... Uh, glue the magnets in, which is actually a good idea because they're kind of pin finicky about gluing in. So do double sandwiches with magnet holes and make those the plates that you use for your different uh, part library parts for the CD Co home, home model. So we can uh, print that uh, and go from there. Uh, let's see what Nathan does not comment. Let's see how much... Yeah, he commented about that on his his log. Hidden magnets, these are what the things look like. Snap glue these together for one sa one sandwich. Um, so that's good there. Now, given that we've got no other people on this, we might uh, see what else do we want to cover on the golf cart. What do you think about the idea of fins on a, on a hydraulic reservoir? Do you think that would be a good idea for a cooler? Abe?
Whoops, I, I had muted my microphone yeah. the other way. Um, it, it sounded like the, uh, the, the fins and the cooling and all that before, uh, let's see, with just using the, the little bit of airflow for the engine, it sounded like the cooling wasn't necessarily um, that big of a deal. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I, I guess um, the experience with that is from, yeah, the, the previous power cubes a while back, and those all had a fairly large cooler, I think. I think yeah. the last one built was like 1708. Um, but it was a different power cube. I'm trying to remember if that was yeah. for. Yeah, that's a good deal. Um, but that was probably for the high back in 10. Yeah. Um, I was also. So it, it sounds like there isn't a huge need, if I understand, for, for a lot of cooling, but there has to be. Some. It, it, I don't know how much that depends on ambient temperature, probably right. ambient than just the. How much the pump is, is running, I guess, right? The, the flow rate. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, what I noticed is that above 12 horsepower, they always use coolers. And less than 12, sometimes they don't use coolers. But we know there's a lot of heat there. Yeah, in the winter, you probably don't have to have any cooling because it's cold enough. But in a 90-degree summer, you will need, you will need some. And so it's not a big performance deal because I think we can do well with some strong fans and some fins. Uh, But the other part is cost because it would cost you like for 8th inch by 2 inch uh, steel plate, uh, steel bar. That's pretty inexpensive compared to a cooler which is 100 bucks plus the fittings. So that might be an advantage to have the cooling right on a tank. It would be a good idea actually. Um, Just occur to me that for for cases where we don't need excessive cooling like maybe not maybe you won't get away with it for the 160 horsepower but for 16 horsepower yeah absolutely uh 16 32 maybe 54 um something that i could 48. see uh you were saying so much bar i think i think the plate that was planned for the or that's been used for the tanks before was maybe like almost a quarter inch thick so for adding fins to the tank or to uh, try to just make some other cooling apparatus that way. I guess if you used sections of pipe, uh, I don't know, how, the cost of hard steel pipe and, and using that um, to connect some things and then putting some cooling off of that, kind of making your own cooler yeah. a little bit necessary. That, that, but that has a lot of complexity. I assume welding some thin sheet metal for fins onto things is um that that's just a bunch of tack welding that that could add a lot of welding but uh yeah, that's probably less of an issue i guess um and sheet metal i guess isn't hard to cut by hand or or if you have a torch table it's pretty easy to do to do fins or something just strips of uh, yeah. thin sheets right yeah that's- um so I upload, I'm uploading your updated clamp to the wiki there because you didn't have that on the wiki. But take a look at this. Uh, it looks quite attractive. Um, oh, did I not push the last version? I thought I got. I just, I just did it right now. But look at this. That looks pretty, pretty exotic. This is what you have. Yeah, this top looks- one is what you got on a wiki. So yeah, I. Uh, oh. oh. That's that was still okay, there. But yeah, I mean that's what's down here. Let's do it. I'll uh, set it up right now. So, yeah, yeah, it could work. I mean, it's pretty thin on this section, so while well, it's pretty fat here, this is a case where. Oh yeah. Is it pretty good at dynamically um, turning the? Let's see, they call it wall and and then infill. I don't know how dynamic uh, the software is about figuring out what to print uh, with. Oh models. yeah, actually. So. Yeah, what we could do here, actually, in this production engineering would be, like, make a fat wall and very low infill. So here, where it has the thin part, yeah. it'll be, like, 100%, but in this fat part, it'll be, like, the lower percent. But, yeah, I'll just print it regular for now, see how it... No messing around, just... Yeah, like, here you got shell thickness. That You yeah. might want to make it, like, 0.8. That's 0.8 millimeter. Make it, like, 
2.4 millimeters or something and then some of these parts that are needed to be strong would be pretty solid um yeah that one part well actually all the parts where it's thin where the bolt goes through and especially at that nut recess it was so thin i was kind of concerned how um well a a large if the extrusion uh is diameter is pretty high uh i wasn't sure how well that would print or if it would get you know enough layers uh yeah. to be strong uh, but I get you, you can set I guess all that all the the uh, not the filament diameter but the actual um, extrusion uh, thickness right. Um. Well, I mean we've got the 0.4 millimeter or it's, filament coming out. Yeah, that'll be fine. I'll be just uh, I'll see what it looks like with 20 percent. And I guess it depends on nozzle and uh, flow rate. And yeah, I'll, I'll make the shell I, thickness gonna, pretty thick, like 2.4 instead of 0. 0.8. Yeah, and then I assume we'll you're using those. more of the, the larger volcano nozzles and stuff like that but I, uh, for uh, more rapid production printing, but uh, I assume it can kind of vary that. No, I'm not speed. doing the volcano on this one. We're not really getting into volcano so oh. much yet, just a regular one. But yeah, so I'll try printing this and see how it goes. Uh, I'll do that like right now, and I'll announce the. I'll make a call out for the the Friday, 1 p.m. On the design sprint on the open source, golf cart, run by a power cube, and then a, later a solar power cube. Right now we'll keep it simple with regular. Uh, functional stuff, but but you can make the solar, which would be a good challenge for uh, student projects or something. So, yeah, yeah, I suppose on this golf cart, um, I guess it'd be good to set up. I think I'll set up the, I'll try to set up the wiki page here a little better. Maybe a, yeah. a part library to yeah, that please. page that'll um, help organize stuff. Uh, yeah, uh, some of the issues it's is the confusion of what. Uh, of time when it just helps. Yeah. So yeah, if you that, set up a part library. Like, uh huh. The uh, let's see, there's a lot. Of, I guess frame. Uh, I mean, this thing needs to be pretty light. Obviously, you don't want to use a lot of heavy hmm, steel, um, <laughs> like a tractor or something like that. Right. Obviously, so so be helpful to do a lot of um, you know quarter inch sheet metal and, and cut parts like that right uh, that's it's correct. gonna have to be uh, there's gonna yeah, have to be a yeah. lot of what uh, I'm thinking is yeah quarter quarter inch so basically uh, essentially a frame like the d3d and a power cube uh, six flat plates and they're gonna be quarter by four for the thickness of the web uh, so it'd be effectively quarter by four angle and I think that'll be plenty strong for and light enough still. So calculations on weight of that would be in order. Mm. We can yeah, optimize different that. design for um, hmm. yeah the arrangement because the tank the tank always needs to be above. So maybe the tank behind the seat or well I see some of these golf carts they have like multiple seats depending on the size here. Maybe there's a forward and rear facing seat. Uh, maybe yeah. you could have the tank between the engine. Uh, you're gonna have to fit the engine underneath the the main seating area, and I guess rear rear wheel drive is well. Yeah, that that's kind of easier, isn't it? I suppose. Well, I wanted um, to do um. What I'd like to do is four wheel drive skid steering golf cart. So it's absolutely ridiculous. The easy no technology. This is like a uh, ridiculously simple version one project. So okay, so four wheel drive. So yeah, because we'll need that too. Yeah. Like if we ever go off into the woods, I mean, we'll need that definitely. Yeah, it makes it nicer. So probably a larger, uh, a larger golf cart ATV de design. Then I mean to. Well, yeah, I mean page yeah. one says five feet by eight feet long. So and sixteen horse is probably a lot of power for. Uh, one of these anyway. I mean, golf carts are usually just simple electric yeah. Uh, yeah. motors, so they're not 
probably not that many horsepower. So, hmm. yeah, this should this should be good. Like basically, no problem in terms of the engineering. Hmm. Yeah, and I guess it. Well, let's see. Yeah, if the cube is separated, hmm. Yeah, kind of make it depending on how it's arranged. Um, be a mobile power source as well, I guess, that way, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's kind of handy. Uh, another farm feature. I, I, you think in, like, an ATV with um, even the possibility of a power takeoff, but that that's something a little bit <laughs> yeah, uh, not larger yet, and heavier, more, yeah, more power. But, but, but the golf basic. cart, either way, it's it's mobile, and so you've got, you've got hydraulics you can hook to something. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I think it'll be pretty quick to uh, re-edit the power cubes. Just think about that again. I suppose for the golf cart issues, it may it may need to be hmm, the, the shape may need to be really different, um, or just but definitely separating the uh, the engine and the tank and the the uh, kind of redoing the power cubes that way. Uh, Without the engine, just having the tank separate and the cooling with the tank, I guess. Yep, separate tank power cube and separate engines so that the engines are super swappable. Um, yeah. Because they, they've been, like, unless we start making our own, like, and I, I think I mentioned the Changfa diesel. And we got to build up our precision machining infrastructure, which is... Not there yet, um, yeah. We, but we will have that. That's in the next eight years. Time's ticking. Twenty twenty-eight. Uh, next nine years, almost a decade. But we got to get all that in place. Precision CNC uh, milling. That that's a whole. Uh, yeah, a whole yeah, other. Yeah, a whole uh, other ball of wax. We haven't touched that much, but yeah. that's in the. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think a lot can be done. Well, that's one thing that makes some of this stuff easier. Um, I suppose you haven't looked at the, the torch table in a while. No, I um, haven't, but the, the, the just the general rollout is finishing off the 3D printer. So right now I'm into the just like s some little upgrades. Like one of the upgrades, as you mentioned, the volcano. Well, we haven't been using the volcano, so I'm, I'm adding that. Um, just freezing that version as a basic version. And then I got to move on to the torch table. Um, yeah. So that's that's the way it's got to go, because because we got to have the steel cutting ability in house, and hopefully with that produce the oxy hydrogen cutting, which well start with oxy acetylene, but oxy hydrogen would be really good because that can also cut aluminum and copper. So oh. yeah. Anyway, um, we're not there yet on that. So for now, we'll just do simple. In the Stone Age, just well, but for the frame, actually, it's convenient to use quarter by four flats because they're cheap, accessible, and we can weld them into the very large frame, just like I did the large frame of the one cubic meter 3D printer from a quarter by half flats. Here, we'll use quarter by four flats to make a huge frame out of six sides. Yeah. Yeah. Um... I, I figure even without the torch table, cutting that quarter inch uh, by hand, if necessary, you can lay that out pretty easily. And uh, yeah, even if that there's some shapes that are a little bit complex, most of the stuff is rough enough that um, you can do it by hand and then weld it. Uh, yeah, you know, together well. Okay. Hey, so let's let's finish here. I got to get rolling. Um, so I'll. I'll send out the announcement to the design sprints list. Are you on that list, email list? Design sprint, I think so. Yeah, you uh, probably are there. The um, but yeah, so I'll do that and announce that, and we'll do we'll get some more progress on doing all the design work, including weight calculations and hopefully a lot of the free free CAD part libraries, so we can uh, start showing how it actually looks. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm working on that part library on the golf cart thing, so. Excellent. Uh, so, yeah, so we'll see you then on Friday. So thanks, everybody, and whoever's watching this. And uh, we'll continue with our next design sprint on Friday and otherwise the regular meeting. 
next Tuesday at the same time, 2 p.m. CST USA time. Thanks a lot. Have a good day. Friday at 1. Yep. Bye-bye.